Good evening once again. It's a pleasure to be back in this series of conversations that we're having in terms of looking at how to advance access to healthcare services by positioning and actually strategically leveraging on the potential and the power of pharmacists and pharmacist professionals in the healthcare space. So on this particular occasion, one, I'll start by apologizing the last Saturday, Sunday, as usual, I was not able to upload, I was out of town, and therefore had some technicalities on my end. And on this particular occasion, just the particular session that I was hoping to share on that day is the one that I'm going to share with you today. And this was on the backdrop of the World Malaria Day that we marked on 25th of April. And this was around community pharmacy partnership for optimal malaria management. And in this session, what I'm making it be about is community pharmacy partnership in primary healthcare service delivery. And this is where we're looking at a case for optimal malaria management, where I'm reflecting on some of the insights and the lessons we learned from the last webinar series that we had through the African Pharmaceutical Network where I was participating. And there were three tracks. That was the first one was looking at community mobilization, social mobilization, and engagement in terms of vector control and related activities. That is the preventive aspect. Then we moved to the second phase where we looked at the diagnosis, where a presentation was made on the rapid diagnostic kit for malaria, and then also the management of malaria using the different therapeutic products that are available. And finally, on the last day, we looked at the policy imperative, the policy need for us to engage as pharmacists in this particular space, and with a special focus on community pharmacies. And so when, I look in, when I'm looking at these, one of the key things that we have to acknowledge is that healthcare service delivery, as it has been, has been focused on the curative aspect. And that is why when you see, even when you're looking at engaging with our leaders in the different spaces, the focus of their conversations have been around, do we have as many hospitals as possible? We have healthcare providers, but where are these healthcare providers working from? They're working from hospitals where they are based. And therefore it means they are responding to sick, care rather than health care. And on that account, then the question would be, how do we make ourselves be indispensable in the healthcare continuum and the healthcare provision journey and actually leverage on the available frameworks that are already existing in our communities? And one of such key frameworks that are already existing is community pharmacy being strategically located where we are. When I leave my house in less than five minutes, I'll, have, I'll be having a pharmacy next to me. I'll go there whether I'm sick or just feeling a little discomfort or related. I might even pass by just to buy personal care products that, that, that is necessary for me. So when we look at that dynamic, then we ask ourselves for the different healthcare conditions that are priority to us as individuals, as a community and as a society, how do we take advantage of this? And on this case, then the key bit for me was in terms of malaria, and it was on the backdrop of the World Malaria Day, as I mentioned. And the key bit would be malaria disease burden and managing scope. When you look at it, what's the burden of malaria? Generally, we know these are diseases that is influenced by the climate conditions, and therefore, the most affected regions are those in the warm, humid regions. For in the Kenyan landscape, we'd be looking at the western region, Nyanza region, Lake Victoria area, and the coastal space, where we have actually a higher burden of malaria in those regions. In others, we have the arid and semi-arid, where we have the condition or where we have outbreaks once in a while, depending on the climate conditions in that spaces. And other areas where we have outbreaks would be the highlands, which will get warm over time. For example, in the Western region, again, when you talk about Montelgon region, so how do we address this burden? In some other areas, we don't have much of malaria. For example, when we're looking at the Kenyan landscape, the central Kenya, the Nairobi province, we have limited level in risk of malaria, except for the transfer cases where we have less, for example, I'm traveling from my home country and I get to the city. Then in that case, then I would already have been infected, or even when I'm planning to travel, I would travel and get infected, then come back again. So how do we address such kind of disease burdens and the different scope for what we have? And in management of malaria, based on the conversations that we are having, we know we have to diagnose to treat. And once we diagnose, that is where we have the diagnostic kits that are coming in. So normally we have the blood smear, that is the conventional treatment method, the diagnosis method of malaria. But currently we have the rapid diagnostic kit which is available and being dispensed in pharmacies and even used by the government facilities in primary healthcare facilities. So then that is in the diagnosis. Once we diagnose, then we need to manage. Management, generally, the first line of treatment is that the metal of the based therapies, which are used in treatment of uncomplicated malaria. Then beyond that, we have other interventions where we're looking at use management of complicated. Generally, we don't manage in our patient, but this would be requiring inpatient treatment. So that is now where another kind of care will come in. Then finally, at the diagnosis level, do we have a follow-up? Do we have a tracking mechanism? Because one of the key things we have to acknowledge is in malaria, optimal malaria management and any other disease, 
there is need for surveillance so that we have data that can give us insights on where do we need to manage, how do we need to manage, and how do we respond to such challenges. So when we look at all this scope of how we could look at malaria management for vector control prevention and related, then to the point that we are doing the follow-up for somebody who has been treated and actually has gotten cured from malaria, there are different aspects that we can play as pharmacies and community pharmacies specifically. And this is based on our strategic positioning, as I mentioned at the start, that we are in the communities, we are part of the social fabric of that community where we exist. And therefore, it is upon us to look at it and see how do we then become indispensable members of the community and valuable at that, because we have a value proposition on what we can offer, what they need, and do we make it valuable to them. So innovative approaches to engage in community pharmacies in malaria management would be key. One for me, one for me would be vector control and malaria prevention. Most of us, we see our pharmacies as points of care. We just tell medicine that is a dispensing aspect of it. If somebody comes with a prescription, you fill it and give it out. But we know, what we never ask ourselves is this vector control. How do we support in that? For example, we know transmission of malaria, the, uh, the anopheles mosquito. So how do we prevent it? We know one, we have the insect repellents that we can apply. We have the, the other, what we call the mosquito nets and related clothing that can be used in terms of the long sleeve in that night when we have a higher risk of exposure. So how do we be a part of the community? We can offer active engagement and sensitization programs where we educate them on what are the control measures. Another thing that used to apply is that we have the environmental control where you now clear bushes, tickets that are closer to homes and houses where people live. Do we take activity in such? I remember when growing up in the village, we used to have the community initiatives that were driven, that were supporting such. For example, you have a cattle dip. And when you have a cattle dip, it has to be cleaned and somebody has to drain the water and actually supply. There were activities that were coordinated from a community standpoint where individual community members would come on a particular day to do the cleaning, to drain the water from the particular cattle dips and actually refill them again and use even contribute money that could be used in buying the particular chemicals that were going to be used in treating that water. On the other end, when we look at the dr drinking pools where we would take animals to drink water, that I mean, watering pots, then the key boot would be, how do we mobilize community? When you're talking about malaria, con con malaria management generally, as pharmacies, community pharmacies, being we have a healthcare domain specialty, therefore it means the community members trust us and they believe in us. Can we initiate such innovative engagements where we could say, well, for example, we know in this region, we have had a higher incidence of malaria. And therefore, for this question, we are urging community members to join us as a, as a pharmacy, to offer a community outreach program where we are going to help clean tickets around maybe, let's say, boarding schools in the neighborhood, whether primary, secondary, because those are now public facilities. Once we do that, we're already positioning ourselves as integral members of that community. And as we do it, we are reducing the burden of malaria and offering service to the community and being allies and partners in making healthcare better. Some of the people who would be affected would be our children, would be our relatives, and even the people in our community who are productive and contributing to the development of our society. So how do we make them better? So those are all the areas that we can engage in vector control and malaria prevention. We have to be innovative and creative in terms of our thinking and looking at what is the end goal for us, reducing the malaria burden. The second bit would be on diagnosis and management. We know there's now an RDT, rapid diagnostic test kits. Can we use them? Yes, we know how to use them. Are we using them? We need to be able to use them actually to diagnose patients when somebody presents with signs of malaria. And one of the key things that we know about malaria is most patients already come, already they have self-diagnosed without the diagnosis kit. So it's upon you to actually advise them that the best way to address them is to be able to diagnose. And therefore you can diagnose them, use the kit to diagnose, test and diagnose if it's there. If having malaria, yes, you can provide that and at a metal based therapies, which is uncomplicated. For those who are diagnosed and you find the malaria, that they are in a very critical condition depending on the severity levels as far the malaria the guidelines for diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of malaria in Kenya, then you can now refer them to some of the higher level facilities, level four, level five, depending on the need and the proximity to the location. And therefore, that means even at that level, you can have structured partnerships where you can partner with these organizations and offer the quality care that people need. And on that account, then you'll be able to support in malaria management and diagnosis. Once we're done with that bit, then another bit, bit in terms of innovative approaches to engage in malaria community management would be in strategic partnerships. When you're talking about working with communities, schools, and related, those are strategic partnerships. What is the value proposition that you're giving to them? 
once you have that value proposition, then the school will be willing to engage with you. And the school being willing to engage with you, these schools use medication when the people are unwell and related. Can you be the strategic ally service provider that would be there for them? As a pharmacy, you can position yourself, especially for the minor ailments, and be able to support. You can have a structured partnership with some of the clinics and hospitals around you to be able to serve them and even the institution-based health facilities, you can be serving them. Other strategic partnership diagnosis, we have pharmaceutical companies that are producing diagnosis, that are producing medicines. Can they have access programs that are partnered through you to support the communities in delivering these solutions? If you're able to do that, then it would help you because you're getting financing in terms of support from that pharma company or that organization. And as you, that, as you get that, you're also delivering an intervention to the community that really needs it. That will be a win for you. And ultimately, when you look at the business case for CPP, when we work in designing such innovative approaches and innovative interventions, there's a business case. One, when you look at it at the lowest level and the most impactful level is that you're serving a community. As you're serving a community, they're gaining benefits and therefore they build trust with you. Nowadays, we understand that the business of any, any business is driven by trust and ability to actually see the authenticity and the value that is in that community organization. We could look at the ESG, environmental sustainability and governance principles that are currently being discussed in different high level forums and even at the very community level. So if you were able to support the community in addressing their needs, they would be willing to do business with you. When they're willing to do business with you, there's that economic incentive because when they're coming to buy medicines from you, that is business, that is money coming your way. And that money is coming because you're going be above and beyond to ensure you deliver value, you serve them in the healthcare journey and you'll be there as a key ally. That is on the first level. The second level, when you're talking about those strategic partnerships and allies, you're making yourself an indispensable member of the community and a person who offers additional value. When that additional value is needed, let's say, for example, by the pharmaceutical companies in delivering their healthcare products to people, you as an ally, they will be able to use you to get that. And one of the key things we know about malaria management, most of it has been driven by the government. And being driven by the government as a development fund, as for example, the Global Fund in terms of financing, as a pharmacy, if you're able to structure such kind of engagements, even if we work on a community pharmacy partnership, then such financing for diagnosis and management could be channeled partially through the community pharmacy. And the key bit would be, we diagnose and manage where we interact with patients because of our strategic location in the communities. Once we do that, we're making value because we're delivering services, but at the same time, we're making money doing that which is being supported and we offer the insights and the data that is now going to inform further future interventions as we support that kind of an engagement. So we look at it from a patient perspective, from a stakeholder partnership perspective, and ultimately at a personal level, that is project management. And project management on one, you have to be able to design a project that is sustainable. Once you make it sustainable, you're generating new scientific literature and evidence. That evidence is room for you to apply for grants, sponsorship projects and related, and even fellowships. Those fellowships are coming with additional opportunities. You grow as a professional and you go as a key stakeholder in the healthcare delivery continuum. That is going to position you for greater successes in your profession. And that is one thing that I think as pharmacists and community pharmacists generally, we can take advantage of. And as we look at all those, then the key bit for us would be looking at how do we make these things sustainable? That is where we talk about a blueprint, a framework that is going to guide our interventions at any one level in time. And in the Kenyan context, we have the Kenya Malaria Strategy 2019 to 2013, with the aim to ensure that we have a malaria-free nation. Then we have the Malaria Indicator Survey 2020 final report, which was actually looking at the progress we've made from 2019 to the current date. And the focus, the, the Malaria Strategy is 2019 to 2023, not 2013. So Malaria Indicator Survey was looking at how, where, how far have we gone? What are the drive, who are the drivers and how have they been contributing? Then you have the national guidelines for the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of malaria in Kenya 2010, which is giving us the specific guidelines on how we need to manage malaria. And the Health Act 2017, which segregated the different functions of government after the regulation, where we have the national government and the county government. When you look at all these policy documents, 2019-2023 malaria strategy was not specific on what pharmacies that can do. And therefore, when we look at that, there was a gap in terms of community pharmacy and even generally pharmacy engagement, because where we have pharmacy being mentioned, we were looking at the role of a pharmacy and the pharmacies in terms of managing the supply, actually, and advisory roles, but not the implementation. But when you look at the indicator survey 2020 final report, it indicated that 0.7% of the population that was surveyed actually obtained mosquito nets from pharmacies. 
Therefore, we already had a role in vector control and malaria prevention. Then we look at the second bit where we're looking at malaria management, whether there's counseling, there's dispensing of medicines. 17.8% of the people who were surveyed indicated that they got sourced or seek sought, sought or actually got these services from a pharmacy. There's already a, a need for us. So the, there's a policy imperative for us to engage. And that policy imperative is that we have evidence already in place, but it's not structured. It is upon the community pharmacies where they're operating and where they're delivering interventions to document some of these best practices, to take lead in actually implementing some of the ideas that they have. Once they implement the document and now engage in policy making tables, then they can now front such kind of ideas. As they front them, they're opening new strategies to get more engagements, more partnership, and actually have our role in malaria management streamlined and made to be a part of the national framework of what we can play in that role. As we do that, most of us will be able to deliver malaria services. And that is how the community pharmacy partnership would be key because we are talking about delivery of services at the primary healthcare level, the primary being the community where we interact with individuals, where they live, where they stay, and we're able to deliver that. And the basic tenet of this, we need to understand that malaria management, when you talk about diagnosis and treatment, would be touching on test, treat, and track. Tracking being on surveillance, testing being diagnosis. We use the rapid diagnostic test case where we can work. Then treat and complicated where you're not able to treat. Please refund, monitor to track to see whether they're getting the care they need. Ultimately, management is not only in the treatment using therapies. We can have the vector control preventive measures. And other than that, preventive measures that I've talked about when you're talking about vector control, looking at mosquito nets and related, we have to acknowledge that now we have a vaccine that is in place. How are we going to position ourselves as vaccination delivery centers? That is another key innovative aspect. And beyond that management component, we need to be able to share evidence, share insight with the developers of these products. Research and development doesn't start in the lab. It starts in the community where you have a need. And it starts in the community where you are trying new interventions. Once you try new interventions and find them impactful, you can share it with the next generation and the next group of people that next group of experts, whether in the lab or in the pharmaceutical companies or whether in the academic field, will be able to develop on that idea. And that is what we wish for, and that is what we hope for each and every one of us. Let's make pharmacy better, and let's advance primary healthcare through pharmacy engagement. Thank you so much. See you in the next session.